before we get too childish, let's head off to somewhere absolutely splendido. Oscar Wilde was one, as were both Laurel and Hardy. Mozart's opera, The Magic Flute, celebrated the fact that he was one. Winston Churchill was one, but not a big important one. And goodness only knows how many members of the royal family have been one. Freemasonry has been around for the last 400 years. It has been seen in the past as being secretive and, if anything, a little sinister. But things are changing in the world of funny handshakes. Modern Freemasons want to present a warmer and more welcoming face to the world. As part of that process, they're opening the doors to lodges like this one in Worcester, revealing the secret treasures within. Whom have you there? Okay, you can come in. <laughs> I bet you didn't expect to see such an enormous space as this. This place houses the second largest museum of Masonic artifacts anywhere in the country. And what an extraordinary, varied and eclectic collection they have. From Mason porcelain to engraved glass, precious bejeweled jewels sitting alongside rather mundane looking objects, but all redolent with symbolism. I'm here to meet Colin Young, not our Colin Young, but the chairman of the museum, to find out more. Well, Colin, it's a treat to be here. And my first question is, how is it that Freemasonry has the reputation to the outsider of being shrouded in secrecy? Is that the case? Not anymore, it was. When uh, the Nazis came into power, we saw what was happening to Freemasons in uh, the conquered lands. They were taken into concentration camps, they were, they were killed. And therefore, in this country, Masons went to quiet. Mm. Their big mistake, and everybody knows it was a big mistake, was to go quiet after the war as well. And it took until about 1981, 84, before we woke up to the fact that if you don't tell people what you're doing, they become suspicious. Mm. Uh, there's no reason to be suspicious. We're open to anyone. Now, Colin, I don't expect to sit alongside the chairman of a museum who's got a two-handled jerry in front of him. What's going on here? This was used in the 19th century when masons were in lodge rooms. Now, they, they didn't have lodge rooms like we have here. They were in pubs. Okay. Once the door was closed and the meeting was going on, um, they tended to stay in the meeting. If a meeting's lasting two and a half hours and you've had three or four pints of decent beer, you might want to use the facilities. And this was a facility which you could uh, pass under the table. Yeah, all very matey. All very um, matey, yeah. <laughs> uh, but what's important and makes it bespoke for masons is the device outside, isn't mm. it? The devices, the two pillars, the all-seeing eye. So that's from the first half of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. yeah. If we move along the table a bit, what is the significance of this group here? Those are what we call charity jewels. I mean, people say they're medals. We call them charity jewels. And if you gave a certain sum of money, you were able to have one of these jewels and wear it on your coat when you went into lodge. I see. The only ones are gold, of course. What is not realized is the incredible amount of money raised oh, by right. masons across the land. I mean, what sort of numbers are we talking about here? Well, from 1981 to now, the Masons are given £55 million pounds to various charities, international disaster relief funds. So you would wear your jewel with pride Absolutely. in this lodge, having made your donation. Okay. So tell me, Colin, about this one. Well, we call that the Hogarth jewel. And it is said to have been designed by Hogarth himself when he was... Uh, Mason, and he was master of the Grand Stewards Lodge in 1753, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Hogarth was, of course, the most extraordinary artist. Oh, fantastic. Uh, the most profligate printmaker of the 18th yeah. century and made a fortune out of it. So we've got a jewel set bezel round the outside, mm -hmm. uh, and then another inside, this flaming aura which goes to make up the central design, all in silver and silver gilt. So would this be a serious treasure in the museum, then? Oh, yes, there are only a couple around in the country, really. And we have one of them, of course. This one, I think, is intriguing, largely because we seem to have 
a checkerboard mm -hmm. engraved under the glass of this cover. We're sitting on the checkerboard. What is the significance of the checkerboard within Freemasonry? Well, in Freemasonry, we say this represents our journey through life. Oh. From um, darkness before our birth into light and into darkness afterwards, I suppose. And the, the middle part of this jewel, where does that come from? That was made by a French prisoner of war, probably 1805, 1800, something like this, during the Napoleonic Wars. They made these basically to sell in order to get food. Moving on, we've got the all-seeing eye above one, two, three, seven stars. Seven liberal arts and sciences. And the all-seeing eye being the eye of God. God. Okay. And if I turn it over, we've got no less a personage than the Prince of Wales, Edward the Seventh to be. Um, he was a Freemason, was he? He was a Grand Master. Hence this jewel. And hence he's wearing his Grand Master's collar. Well, that's marvellous. I can't thank you enough. I see we've got a gavel here. Mm. What do Freemasons use the gavel for? Well, the gavel is to call attention and, and keep order in the lodge. Yes. In the gavel. And, of course, we're about to shuffle off to an auction where we have a certain very famous auctioneer who's very good at keeping us all in order. <laughs> thank you very much, Colin, for having us. Thank you, Tim.